Good evening. Please come on in, grab a song book, and turn to number 10. Number 10. After we sing this song, we'll be letting our opening prayer and dismiss our classes. Let us sing. The law of the Thank you for this day. Thank you for all your, all your many blessings. Please help anyone that is sick to get better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ah, good evening. It is a pleasure to be back with you tonight. I want to take a moment and thank Chris for facilitating our class last week. And uh, I did get to watch the, the class and the video and uh, appreciate the uh, presentation. And I think it complemented what we're trying to do very well. Uh, I was, um, I guess you might say, scolded a little bit from one of the members of the class. Uh, who wanted to know, when are we going to study Genesis? And uh, I just want to go ahead and clarify uh, this evening uh, why we're taking our time uh, with what we are taking our time with. Uh, as we talk about worldviews, the battle of ideas, we understand that it doesn't get any more basic than the question of origin. Where did we come from? What are we doing here? Do we even have a destiny or a future? When one is not able to address or unwilling to address these questions, or if they're willing to take a very different view than, for example, the one we would take, uh, their life, their attitude, their outlook, their behavior in every respect will be different. Now, they may do a lot of the same things we do. They may like a lot of the same things we like. Not that they're different species of human beings, as I suggested at one lecture in this series, uh, but they do think very differently, and they feel and act very differently about every subject 
under the shining stars, as we use that expression here in Georgia. Um, and so I think it's important that we take a little time. Now, someone may say, but this is a Bible class. It's a church setting, and we're all church members. Uh, we are here because we already believe in God. We believe in the Bible. I understand that, and I appreciate that, and I applaud that. But by the same token, I'm also aware, as I hope you are, that regardless of who we are and what we believe at the moment, we live in a world that is filled with false ideas, outright lies, and deception. It's everywhere, all the time. I was teaching my grandsons uh, this morning uh, to split firewood. They didn't know exactly how to do that. Uh, they learned how to sling them all and how to break firewood, so it actually worked out pretty good for me. I was able to get a little win-win out of that. I was able to teach them something which I'm sure they were glad to learn, and I was glad for them to learn it. But while we were talking at some point, I don't know why, they began saying something. I heard, overheard them talking, and one of my grandsons said to the other, well, you know, a million years ago, and I I just immediately stopped and said, wait a minute. There was no million years ago. Now, I can say that in this class with safety, but what I just said is a very unpopular view, even among church-going people. People that say, I believe in God. I believe in heaven. I even believe in hell. There are few that do, but I believe in hell. But I just don't know that we can write off all of the data, all of the facts, all of the scientific evidence that points to the fact that the earth has been here for millions of years and human beings have been evolving for millions of years, but still I believe the Bible. I understand for most of you in the class tonight, maybe some tuning in on the internet may not understand this, but those of you in the class probably think, that's crazy. How, how could you say you believe the Bible, you believe in God? And you would be surprised. A lot of people never took the time to do what we're doing right here. They just never thought about it. And I want to submit something to you, and I hope you'll hear this point, because this is the reason, this is what motivates me to do this. I'm not afraid that there's going to be a wholesale apostasy uh, among our ranks and that we're all going to run off and say, I don't believe in God anymore. I just don't think that's going to be a major issue for us. I don't think that at all. I do, however, think that if we don't take the time to fortify our faith, to make sure that the foundation for our faith is solid and secure, then we will be subjected to the lies, the propaganda. It's everywhere. Everywhere you go, it's on the radio, the TV, it's in the newspapers, if you still read those, it's on the internet, it's on every TV sitcom or movie, I mean, it's everywhere, it's at work, it's in your family. I mean, every, Rush Limbaugh, I mean, you know, we, sorry that he's gone, but I really admired the man, I thought he was a great radio host, I appreciated his thoughts and ideas, but he would routinely talk about, you know, the scientific evidence for millions of years of earth history, and I'm like, that was very disappointing to me because he's a very intelligent man, as you know, well-versed. But he represents, I think, the bulk, the mainstream of American thought today. And, and you say, but why does that matter? Why would it really matter if I think that the earth is millions of years? Well, I'm going to explain it to you. We're studying the book of, I know, Terry, if you're listening, we're studying the book of Genesis. Okay, yes, we're going to get back to Genesis. We're still in Genesis. We're just kind of taking a little sidetrack here, on some thoughts from chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. You don't have to say, throwing up your hands in despair, I don't believe in God anymore. But if a seed of doubt can be planted in the back of your mind, if you can watch one of the slick Discovery Channel programs where you see dinosaurs, by the way, Terry, if you're listening, uh, we'll probably be talking about dinosaurs. Uh, in the coming days, and we're going to cover extensive discussions over my grandson's favorite topic. So we will be discussing dinosaurs, Lord's willing. Uh, but again, these are re there's a reason behind it. I'm not just trying to waste time. I want to make sure you understand from a 
biblical perspective that our worldview is formed and is clarified by the word of God and our understanding that there is a God, he is our creator, and he has spoken to us, he has revealed his will to us. So we need to make sure that our faith is fortified. And to do that, we have to be able to answer it for no other reason for ourselves, the things that we are hearing. Is there an answer to what we're hearing? Now, Sister Brown, you had a comment or a question? This is part of the war that we are involved in. Amen. We are in a war. They hire our influencers on the internet in order to push a certain uh, subject. Yes, ma'am. A subject just for, you know, who knows what the subject's going to be. And these people are, their main thing is to, exactly that right there, either uh, to propagate creationism, evolutionism, every bad thing that we could possibly, we'd have nightmares if we knew of what was going on to influence our children. Our children, our, our grandchildren, children yeah. And our grandchildren. And most three, most three-year-olds now can, can get on the computer. And <laughs> if we don't protect our internet, if we don't put uh, stop gaps on our computers to stop those children from just accidentally seeing all the most horrendous stuff in, in the world. Well, you don't have to look go far. And it's everywhere. It's, uh, it's, it's everywhere. Just, Amen to that. Arm ourselves, and right now, I think this is an important part of that. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I, here's part of uh, what I want to address in this series, and that is the question, which worldview is more closely aligned with actual science? When I, when I speak of science, what do I mean by that? When I say science, I, I don't mean the scientific community. That's a whole different ball of wax. The scientific community, I'm sorry, have been bought and paid for, literally. They have to write certain papers, take certain positions. They have to promote certain ideas. Otherwise, they'll lose their government grant. It's not really complicated. That's why they do what they do, follow the money trail. So they say, well, they're scientists. Uh, well, they may be scientists, but what they're promoting is anything but science. And so I want to talk to you about which view and Again, I think I've made this point, but in the creation model or the evolutionary model, we're thinking now about the Darwinian model, which is the most prominent, probably the only one that really is even thought about anymore. Uh, but again, if you look at these questions of origins, which of these two better fits actual science? What coincides with what we know about law, uh, known laws of science? Now, when you say a law of science, what do I mean by that? I mean, there are, there are theories in the scientific world, but, okay, it's observable, but it's not just observable. What is it? What do we, what's another word for the law of? The, huh? It's proven. It's an established, recognized, it's a non-disputable fact. Okay, what goes up? Why? What? There's a law of? So we understand it's a scientific law, right? We, we recognize that. And we've already talked in our class about the law of entropy or the second law of thermodynamics. I know some of you are looking at that, how everything is deteriorating, not getting better. It's, not, it's becoming more chaotic, not the other way around, which, again, the creation view more squarely fits, in fact, perfectly parallels with this version of the law of entropy. And then we talked about genetics, uh, certain things. We saw that again last week and some of that in the presentation, but I appreciated that. But in the genetic pool, how many times do cats give birth to dogs? Or how many times do monkeys give birth to people? Now you say, well, we kind of chuckle and we laugh, but if you are a Darwinian evolutionist, you have to believe that at some point in the past, in the far distant past, a monkey gave birth to a human being. Or a human being gave birth to a monkey or something. I don't know which one came first. I'm not sure they have figured that out in their little fairy tale time scale. But the point is, genetically speaking, the biblical view perfectly fits 
the genetic principles we have recently discovered. After its kind is a repeated phrase by God in the opening words of the book of Genesis. And it's still a law today. Of course, we talked about the order and the design of our solar system, of our galaxy, of the billions of galaxies, of our body, uh, the way our body functions. And we didn't get a chance to go into great detail there. But again, if you look at the order and design, even evolutionists, including Darwin himself, when looking at the human eye, said, I just can't conceive that it was just here by happenstance. It had to be designed. And of course, we understand uh, when you see design, you recognize behind it is a designer. Now, I want to quickly discuss tonight, and I want to get bogged down in any of this, but there's another law in science. It's called the law of biogenesis. Now, if I'm not mistaken, somebody that's not been out of college or out of high school longer than I have, you might want to help me with this. But I do remember someone discovered and patented, if you will, the idea that we now know is an established law of biogenesis. Was it, it wasn't Louis Pasteur, was it? Who was it? I don't remember. Should have done my homework before I came to class. But, you know, there was a, there was a view for a long time. For example, this is an example that I remember being used before this law of biogenesis was fully established, understood, and articulated the way it is. It was thought that when a cow defecated in the ground, before we worried about global warming, and there were cows defecating on the ground, uh, that flies would spontaneously generate from that pile of manure. And so the idea was that life spontaneously generates itself. It just, like magic from poop, it just creates life. Well, it was discovered that the reason flies come from cow patties uh, is because flies had already landed on those cow patties and had already deposited their eggs or larvae or whatever flies do. And they left their leavings in that pile of manure and from it came other flies. So it wasn't a spontaneous generation, but this is where the study began. This is the concept, a very primitive concept that would help for a long time. We believe, many did, that life just spontaneously generated itself. But we now know, and this not disputed, whether you are an evolutionist or whether you are a creationist, it doesn't make any difference. Everybody knows and recognizes a scientific law known as biogenesis. Simply put, Life comes from pre-existing life. It doesn't just poop out of thin air. It comes from something. Life comes from life. So the law of biogenesis. Now this is interesting because uh, I think this is the verse you were asking about, Chris, last week. George Wald in the mid-20th century, a renowned at that time, this is ancient stuff really, but he was a well-known and recognized and oft-quoted evolutionist a Harvard professor, he had to be smart, right? This is a quote from him, this is from um, way back, late 1950s, 1954 actually. He said, one has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet here we are, as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. You know what bothers me about this quote is the grammar. I've never really checked it, but I don't think grammatically this works. But, and again, he's just a Harvard professor, but you might want to check me on that, but I think there's some grammatical problem with this quote. This is a direct quote from George Wald, who was a professor at Harvard, who was a well-known, widely read, widely sought after evolutionary speaker. And he said, that spontaneous generation of living organism is impossible. Yet, here we are. Therefore, what, what is he really saying? Okay, we, we know that spontaneous generation is impossible, but I am not for any reason for a second going to believe in God. I'm not going to do it. I will not do it. Now, what do you call that? Well, Romans 1 calls that suppressing the truth. You know the truth is there. You see it. There's no excuse for you to take the position that you are. But you're going to take it anyway. Why? Because I want it to be so. This is a smart man. We're not talking about some dummy. We're talking about a man that's well-versed, well-educated, 
He's a Harvard professor. And this is what he's saying. The spontaneous generation is impossible. Yeah, here we are, therefore I believe in it. And I'm saying this to reinforce, again, this is, this is the propaganda that we get every day. You go to church, you believe in God, you believe in the Bible because it makes you feel good. Because it's therapeutic or whatever. But, you know, I'm, I'm more science-based in my worldview. Really? So this is the kind of thing you call science? You, you recognize that it's impossible, but I believe in it anyway. You can prove it's impossible, but I believe it anyway. Okay, I'm just saying that propaganda that's bombarding our minds, we need to recognize where it's coming from. Now, evolutionists reject God, of course, but they've replaced God, and they have a new God. And I want to talk a little bit tonight. This is the bulk of our lesson. We're going to talk about time. And I already see the look on your face. You're like, oh, no, this is going to get bad. It's, it's not going to get bad. Just stay with me. I got some funny t slides in here, too. You'll be laughing in a minute, hopefully. But for evolutionists, time is God. Time has replaced God. I mean, we read Moses' words, in the beginning, God. These people look at it and say, in the beginning, boom. And it just keeps going, like the Energizer Bunny. And it's just getting more and more complex and organized as we go along because that's their view. doesn't fit science, but that's it. But you're not scientific if you don't believe what they're pr promoting. Okay, that's, I just want you to remember that. Every time you hear this stuff and it's thrown at you and it's constantly thrown at you, remember, wait a minute, Who's telling me this? Who's saying this? Now, for Darwin's theory to even have an inkling of a chance, we have to have a lot of time. And, and we'll see in a moment why that's the case. But I want to submit to you that with the law of science as we know it, the law of biogenesis we just talked about, I don't care how long we're talking about. Billions and billions and billions of years, life does not spontaneously generate itself. Lightning can strike all the mud puddles it wants. It's not going to make human beings in a Bible class talking about where do we come from. It's not going to happen that way. But that's what we're supposed to believe. Lightning struck a mud puddle, and here we are talking about it. That's absurd to the highest degree. But that's what we're supposed to believe. But again, we, we put time up here because... Well, let's just go through some of these quotes here. Marshall and Sandra Hall, in the article, The Truth, God, or Evolution, they say, it is not easy to overthrow, and this is interesting, it's not easy to overthrow a belief, however absurd and harmful it may be, which your civilization has promulgated as the scientific truth for the better part of a century. It's, it's hard to undo that. And, and I'm going to say this again, I'm going to keep on coming back to this, I think a lot of the problem we're seeing in our society today is churches and church leaders are not spending enough time on these kinds of topics. We need to be well-versed in this stuff. We need to be, of all people, well-versed because our feet are solidly planted on reality, not just some fanciful view or hopeful fantasy, but solid reality. And we need to reassure ourselves of these truths. But again... We're hearing this, bombarded with it. Our kids are, we are, everybody around us is, everybody bombarded with these ideas. You say, what ideas are those? I like what they're going to say. Time, as poets and insurance salesmen remind us, is the enemy of life. But time has its friends too. Without great, incomprehensible, immeasurable stretches of time to fall back on, the evolutionist would be Sitting ducks for the barbed queries of even high school students. Time is the evolutionist refuge from the slings and arrows of logic, scientific evidence, common sense, and the multiplication tables. The proven uncertainties about scientific dating are a well-kept secret. And that's what we're going to hear talk about. But, you know, I know what you're thinking in the back of your mind. Just hold on. I know what that thought is. I'm going to get to it in a minute. I promise. I know what you're thinking. But you, you see all this scientific equipment. You, you probably think that somewhere there's a group of, you know, white-tailed, coat-wearing men, you know, with their funny-looking glasses, 
uh, you know, bo bottle bottom glasses, and they're walking around in their little laboratories, and they've got this box, it's like a microwave, and they pick up some kind of organic material, and they throw it in it, and they punch the buttons, and after a few minutes, bing, and they open the door, and it tells them exactly how old that thing is. You probably think there's a device out there that does that. Okay, I'm glad you think that, but you probably think that for good reason, because you're told stuff like that all the time. We know how old this rocket. Well, okay, maybe, maybe we don't. Let's just, let's just stick with reality here for a minute. But the average person reading his newspaper or magazine gets the clear impression that dear, and that's the word I'm thinking about is impression. These impressions matter. Did God say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What did Eve know? She knew what God said, but what was his tactic? He wasn't saying, they ain't a God. He's not real. He didn't say anything. He didn't say that. He said, do you understand him? You sure you got that? And so if Satan can bombard our minds with these impressions that dating is as science as, a science as exact, rather, as the addition of fractions, since no one can envision 10,000 years, much less a half million or a million years, Quote unquote, scientists can hide behind the 2,000 millions of years that they say evolution took. And they can hide there in relative safety, they think. I thought this was a pretty good way of laying the groundwork here. I, I like this guy. He's easy to pick on. He's a very smart guy from Harvard. He's a Harvard professor. Really smart guy. The important point is, and this was back in the 1950s, but he said the important point is that since the origin of life belongs in the category of at least once phenomenon, Time is on its side. However improbable we regard this event or any of the steps which it involves, given enough time, it will almost certainly happen at least once. And for life as we know it, with its capacity for growth and reproduction, once may be enough. By the way, I know y'all saw uh, Jurassic Park. I mean, you, you had to have seen it. You, you, you weren't alive if you haven't seen Jurassic Park. And your kid probably seen it and memorized every word of it. Okay, but there's this nerd guy, I can't remember his name, but there's a nerd guy on there. He's got to have a nerd guy on every show now. And there's a nerd guy on there. And the nerd guy is the one who said, life will find a way. You know, something like that. And he's constantly saying it. Who's that weirdo guy? What I'm thinking about? You know, what's his character name? You know. See, I told you. I told you. She's a lot older than me. She knows. Malcolm, that's his name. He's a smart guy that knows everything, and life will find a way, you know. Yeah, yeah, that guy. He played a law and order, too. Anyway, but again, notice how he's looking at this. Life with its capacity for growth and reproduction once may be enough. Not really. Time is, in fact, the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal with is of the order... <laughs> This is old stuff, okay? Two billion years. Now, they've had a lot of time since the 1950s. It, it just keeps growing. I guess you knew that. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience. By the way, how do you define science? Can you define science outside of human experience? What is science? What is a scientific method? You're able to take a theory, and you're able to make a test, and you're able to reproduce that test once, twice, three times. You keep reproducing until you get the same outcome, right? And so it's through empirical investigation you're able to figure it out. Notice what he's saying. This is a Harvard professor telling us that scientifically we should buy into this impossible view of reality. And so on the basis of human experience, it's meaningless here. So just forget science. Forget the law of biogenesis. Forget everything you know about science because we're scientists. And we're telling you, forget about it. Now, he didn't say that, but he did say that. That's what he's saying. Just don't pay attention to the stuff that's real. Don't pay attention to science because, hey, given enough time, the impossible becomes possible. The possible, probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracle. I told you a minute ago, time for the evolutionist has supplanted God. They literally attribute miracles to time. And they have to. Because if you're looking at this in a purely scientific standpoint, you cannot possibly say 
yeah, evolution and the Darwinian view is the correct view and I should be more inclined to follow reality because that's where reality is. You can't do that. He's admitted it here. That's not the case. This is all fantasy and he's telling us this is a fantasy. We've all got this same fantasy. We want all of you to believe the same fantasy we believe. Why? Because we don't want to believe in God. Romans 1, why? Because they suppressed a knowledge of the truth. It wasn't they couldn't know God. They weren't thankful. Their thoughts weren't holy. They turned against God. They became rebellious, and they did all kinds of unseemly things. Look at what's happening in our world today with this kind of garbage being shoved down our throats every day. It's coming at us every day. We have to be aware of it, recognize it, and dispel it. This is not real. But this is what we're supposed to believe. These guys saying this stuff, these are the scientists. And you Christian people, you're over there with your Bibles and you're clinging to your wannabe feel-good stuff. No, I, I want reality. I want reality. And I believe that the biblical view more comports with reality than anything we've seen so far in this evolutionary junk. It's a fairy tale. It is not science. I just don't want you to forget that thought. R.L. Weinstein said in his book, The Creation Evolution Controversy, both evolutionists and creationists believe evolution is an impossibility if the universe is only a few thousand years old. There probably is no statement that could be made on the topic of origin which would meet with so much agreement from both sides. Setting aside the question of whether vast time is competent to propel evolution, we must query if Best time is indeed available. Now forget that question. Do we really have billions of years to deal with? Well, are we dealing here with this billion of years concept? By the way, in the 1950s, it was 2 billion. Now the Earth is 4.5 billion, but the galaxy is what? 8 billion, 9, 10 billion. The universe is what? 12 billion. I mean, you know, it's a big explosion and then all the stuff started coming together and making and forming what we know of as our galaxy etc and it took a while before we get to planet earth it took a while before it got to us so i mean don't get lost in this fantasy that they painted but again is it based on reality is it based on scientific fact or just a bunch of assumptions it's a quick the question for tonight is the claim for the great age based on solid scientific evidence and i think we're going to see that's not the case um Stephen Morbath, an evolutionist associated with the University of Oxford. No terrestrial rocks closely approaching an age of 4.6 billion years have yet been discovered. He lived a little longer than, closer to our time than Walls, so that we went from 2 billion to 4.6. But anyway, the evidence for the, that's a lot of time, by the way. 2.6 billion years is a lot. We just more than doubled the age of the, Anyway, the, the evidence for the age of the earth, it, by the way, if you're making this up as you go, you can make it whatever age you want to, by the way. I'm just, I'm just going to say that. The evidence for the age of the earth is circumstantial based upon indirect reason. What do you call that? How would you just, I, can, I, can, I cannot think of a nice way to say it, but how would you say that in a nice way? Oh, we, we don't see any evidence for it, but we believe it anyway. Because we're scientists. And this is, this, they're saying this. this is not me, not a preacher. This is not some Bible class teacher. This is an evolutionist. And this is what he's saying. We don't have any evidence for it, but we believe it anyway. Yes. It goes back to that example I gave last week. Uh, but we know how old that rock is because of the fossil in it. We know how old that fossil is because the rock was in it. Yeah, it's circular reasoning. Yeah. Well, again, it's indirect reasoning. I mean, wow. John Eddy, another evolutionary astronomer he said there is no evidence based solely on solar observations that the sun is 4.5 to 5 billion years old and he goes on to say if i can get my thing to advance wait a minute i missed something anyway i didn't i'll get to it later what about carbon dating now that's the, i know that was the question you're asking because it's that machine it's like a microwave and it's in their little laboratory and they can take in a bone or a rock or whatever. They can throw it in there and shut the door and click, click, you know, 30 seconds, one minute, whatever. And then beep, it goes off. And they pull it out and say, oh, and there's the reading. It's so many millions of years old. Because we know because the machine told us. And that's, am I being too simplistic? Is that, that the way we view it, isn't it? Because they tell us this. Radiocarbon dating has established this rock to be blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, okay. 
In a 2000 book, Gene People and Languages, renowned Stanford University, I'm picking all of these, I believe, school. Anyway, his geneticist Luigi Cavalli Sforza, in a dis discussion on the theory of human evolution, commented on radiocarbon dating. That's what he said. It's not a preacher. Not a preacher. He said the most crucial dates in modern human evolution are unfortunately beyond the range of the radiocarbon method, which has a limit of about 40,000 years. Did you know that? I mean... It's not the 1950s, it's 2000. See, we're getting closer to time. I'm, I'm bringing you along. But again, you see how this thing is transitioning. But notice what he's admitting here. Radiocarbon dating can date how long, how far back in the past? 40,000. I was asking uh, my CPA before church tonight. I said, what percentage of a million is 40,000? 0.04. I'm like, that's weird. I didn't know that. I got a phone. I'm like, oh. So she calculated on the calculator. But it's 4%. 4% of a million. And that's as far back of a million. Now, we're told that human beings have been here for 2 million years, evolving into what we are now. 2 million years. And we know this because we dug up Lucy's bones. They were like 1.8 million years old. I, you know, we threw them in the microwave. We shut the door and hit the little button. and came out and said 1.8 million. There it is right there. And we know that. But notice what he just admitted. You can't go further than 40,000 years. That's interesting. Did you know that? Oh, I love this guy. This, this is the poster child of evolution today. Richard Dawkins. Uh, one of the meanest human beings ever to grace our planet. Uh, he would have been great teaching Hitler, for example. Uh, just he's a, he's a maniac. And I, I, I say that sincerely. Maniac. He's a mental maniac. Uh, he's one who is clear... I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I don't pretend to be one. And I don't know how to examine this guy, but listening to him rant and rave on this subject, it's clear he has some deep-seated emotional trauma somewhere. I don't know what it is. What caused him to be this way, what he's suppressing, I don't know. There's something not right about this guy. But he's a very well-versed, intellectual, evolutionary speaker. Richard Dawkins, the poster child of evolution. And you, you hear him speaking, and you think, this guy's a maniac. He, he literally is. He literally is a living example of Romans 1. And what does Romans 1 mean? Well, this is the guy that shows you what Romans 1 looks like in, in real life. But anyway, notice what he said. Different kinds of radioactive decay-based geological stopwatches, he's using a lot of metaphors here, they run at different rates. The radiocarbon stopwatch buzzes round at a great rate. He, by the way, British, so so fast that after some thousand of years, its spring is almost wound down, and the watch is no longer reliable. Okay, you got the stopwatch, and you and you wind up. You know, it's an old watch. You wind it up, right? But you know, you do it too many times, and you do it too too far. You keep winding too tightly, and Eventually, what happened to the spring? It sprung, right? It didn't work. What's what he's saying? That if you go back too far in time, that spring that calibrates this stopwatch that we are using to guess for time, it's not reliable. But that's not all he said. He said, it is useful for dating organic material on the archaeological historical time scale where we're dealing in hundreds or a few thousand years. But... It is no good for the evolutionary time scale where we are dealing in millions of years. Did you know that? I mean, this guy is not a friend of Christianity. He would not countenance a class like that. He would not come in his class. He, he thinks we're a bunch of lunatics. And he says as much. And, and yet, notice what he just said about radiocarbon dating. Now, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, but scientists have proven, they haven't proven anything. They've made a lot of assertions. They've made a lot of claims. They've said a lot of stuff, but it doesn't prove anything. And we know that rock is so many billions of years old. How do you know that? Well, I said it. I mean, this man is not a friend of ours in the theological world. And yet, he's freely confessing. Radiocarbon dating only works back to a few thousand years. Interesting. June of 1990, this is an interesting example of this. Hugh Miller submitted two dinosaur bone fragments to the Department of Geosciences at the University of Tucson, Arizona for carbon-14 analysis. 
one fragment from an unidentified dinosaur, the other from an Allosaurus excavated by James Hall near Grand Junction, Colorado in 1989. Miller submitted the sample without disclosing the identity of the bone. It's kind of like if you're, if you're doing a pie tasting uh, thing and you're a judge and they put a blindfold on you and they put pies in front of you and you're eating all that good pie and you have to decide which is the best pie. That's kind of what we're doing here. We're just giving you bone. We're not telling where we got the bone or what the bone means or what we think the bones are. We're just giving you bone. Tell us what you think about the bone. So Miller submitted the sample without disclosing the identity of the bones. Had the scientists known the samples actually were from dinosaurs, they would not have bothered dating them. Since it is assumed dinosaurs lived millions of years ago outside the limits of radiocarbon dating, Interestingly, the C14 analysis indicated the bones were from 10,000 to 16,000 years old. A far cry from their alleged 60 million year old age. 10,000? You know, when I, when I was in archaeology class, I would have to concede you might find 8,500 8, years of Earth history if you look at certain texts a certain way. That's stretching it. I mean, you're still under 10,000 years from a biblical standpoint. And, and I'm saying that in a Bible class, you're probably going, wait a minute. Is that right? It just sounds funny, doesn't it? I mean, they're at the less than 10,000 years old. It doesn't sound right. Why? Because even my grandkids splitting firewood talk about millions of years ago. Where did they hear this stuff? It's in their cartoons. It's everywhere you go. They're exposed to this stuff all over the place. And we have to recognize it and understand it and stamp it out of their mind. If we don't, we're going to lose them. We're losing a generation because we're not paying attention to what they're being taught. This is garbage, and it's being pumped into their minds every single day. And you say, well, they're not, they go to church. They believe in You don't need ever to rest on your laurels when it comes to this stuff. Never take any fact for granted. Make sure you understand what your kids are believing, what they're being taught, where they're coming from. I like what Wayne Jackson said about this, about dating methods. I'm going to get a little bit off the scales for me, but... He does make this point. He says, dating methods presume it's just factored in evolutionary history. This is their starting point. We believe in billions of years, therefore we're going to find billions of years in our dating methods. That's basically the point he's making here. and He's, he's accurate. For example, now don't get bored with this. I just, I'll, I'll try to explain it to you. But uranium-238 called a parent element well, through a series of decomposition processes, ultimately produced lead 206, called a daughter element. So it transforms into this. Scientists believe they know the present decay rate, the rate at which it is decaying. Thus, if a rock contained both uranium 238 and lead 206, the ratio of the two elements will be used to estimate the age of the sample. How much of this do we have and how much of that could one lead to the other? And this happens over time. We know what the rate is, and so we can guess about the age of this based on this decay rate scale that we're using. You understand that's an assumption, but anyway, that's, that's where they're going with this. Okay, it is conceded, however, that in order for this method to be valid, certain assumptions must be granted. It must be assumed that neither the parent nor the daughter element have been altered in mass since the beginning. However, there is an increasing body of evidence which indicates that both parent and daughter elements under the proper conditions can migrate in the rocks, thus radically affecting any result that might be obtained. You can't trust this, is what he's saying. But again, let's go on. This is what Frederick Juneman, he's an evolutionist, what he says about it. The age of our globe, this is an evolutionist, the age of our globe is presently thought to be some four and a half billion years based on radio decay rates of uranium and thorium. Such, quote, confirmation may be short-lived as nature is not to be discovered quite so easily. There has been in recent years <laughs> the horrible realization <laughs> that radio decay rates are not as constant as previously thought nor are they immune to environmental influences. I'll say more about that in a minute. This could mean that the atomic clocks are reset during some global disaster. And events which brought the Mesozoic age to a close may not be 65 million years ago, but rather within the age and memory of man. Wow. 
That's a big admission, isn't it? Again, this is an evolutionist. He's just saying basically what Brother Jackson said, but this is just an example of what Brother Jackson was saying, what he's talking about, this kind of thing, what he's talking about. And he's just freely admitting it. We, we're horrified when reality slaps us upside the head. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe we've been playing games with these numbers. I mean, that's what he's saying. You know, he does mention a global disaster. Now, Terry, if you're listening, I promise, Lord willing, we're going to get out of this stuff and we're going to move into Genesis 3 and 4 and 5. And when we get to 6 through 9, we're going to talk about a global disaster. And this global disaster was just that. It was global. But it was so profound that in the New Testament, when the Apostle Peter referred back to that period of time, he used an interesting phrase. He said, the world that then was being overflowed with. What does that mean, Peter? It means there was something radically different about the world then as opposed to now. And by the way, if you think about the entire globe covered in water and all that sloshing around and all these the dirt and the mud and all that sludge just piled them one on top of the other, making layer upon layer. It took millions of years to do, of course. But we've got trees growing through several strata. But we'll say more about that in a minute. But again, if you think about how this happened in a global disaster, well, that's going to change everything about how you're radiocarbon dating anything. Because it's all, it's just thrown out the window. Because there's not a consistent decay rate because there are outside influences mud water disaster volcanic ash volcanic lava etc i mean it's going to change and alter whatever it is you're looking at and these scientists quote unquote evolutionists there's a difference by the way you could be a scientist and an evolutionist you could be a scientist and a creationist but these evolutionary scientists are freely admitting their dating methods aren't real. And yet, when you watch the Discovery Channel, how many times have you heard someone say, well, we know that this was the Mesozoic Age and 65 million years ago when someone... How do they know that? Well, because we said it. And we've been saying it now for so long, nobody's challenged us. And we got all the government grants to tell us to say this. And who are you to question me? That's where we are. Literally, this is where we are today. And you, you think, well, how, how can we get rid of God so easily? Well, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. There was a big want to on the part of mankind. Humanity wanted to dismantle the very concept of God. Why? It's liberating, we think. If I don't have to answer to God, I can do whatever I want. I can live however I want. I don't have to answer for anything. I just do what I please. And who are you to judge me, man? You ever wonder where those concepts came from? When you throw out God in the Bible, that's where you wind up. Who are you to judge me? I'll do my thing, you do your thing. I got my truth, you got your. What is that? You know, I told you about what Ravi Zacharias said about that, about your own truth. Hey, well, he said, this stuff came out of India, and it did, this kind of crazy nonsense, this non think thinking. But he said, this idea came out of Hinduism in, in India. He said, but even in India, people look both ways before they cross the street. Why? Because they know if I step out in front of a Mack truck going 65 miles an hour, reality is going to run over me. But what if you don't believe? What if your truth says, I'm walking on the beach? What if your truth said, I'm just sitting out and having a campfire, you know, meeting, singing Kumbaya? I mean, but you walked in front of a Mack truck. But I don't believe that it's there. I don't care what you believe, it's going to kill you. So even there, where these maniacs are teaching this stuff, where it originated, they look both ways for the cross street. By the way, when Robbie Zacharias said that to the CNN reporter, she's like, huh, what did you say? She didn't understand what he was saying. She had to explain himself. I'm like, well, <laughs> reality is real, and it hurts. So you got to pay attention to what's real. And so here we are, reality facing this philosophy. So we'll end here with this question. Is there evidence then for an earth less than 10,000 years old? And I, I do believe there's a lot to be said about that. Before that bell rings, you got about 30 seconds. Anybody want to say anything or comment? Yell at me. Yes, ma'am.
It's a philosophy. Both are philosophies. And the question is, which philosophy best fits with known science? That's, that's the only question we're raising here. Which philosophy? Because I was in the beginning to see God when he made dinosaurs. I didn't see him do it. It would be cool to see it, but I wasn't there. He even asked Job, were you there when I did it? No, he wasn't there. But none of us were there. We were there on the sixth day, and that was it. After the cows were made, we were made. After the cows and the pigs. And after the dinosaur, we came last. Yes? Jeff, Jeff, um, yeah. Growing up in Maryland in school back then, back in the early, late 70s, early 80s, um, we were allowed to, well, our parents were allowed to let us not go to these classes. Like they used to send home a form saying, hey, listen, this is what we're about to teach. If you don't agree with it, you can teach you to keep your child out. And then we would go and watch like movies in a separate room or whatever. If they had brought, if those days were still intact, I think we'd be a lot better off. So, oh, yeah. um, I think my parents were awesome, but they also said, my parents used to tell me when I was, when we were learning this in school, they were like, if everything still evolved, don't you think trees would be like 700,000 feet high by now? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I'm, I love my parents, but I mean, that was all I needed to hear. You know what I mean? That was it. You, think about it. I want you to think about the population of mankind with that thought in mind before we come back next time. I'm not sure what we're doing next Wednesday. Um, are we having class? I haven't discussed it with anyone. I mean, good by me, but I don't know if we're, it's gonna be a holiday week and a lot of people be on the road. So anyway, I'll have to get with the powers that be and see what we're gonna do. We'll let you know perhaps by Sunday what we'll do next Wednesday. But anyway, thought just crossed my mind. I don't know if we're gonna be doing anything or not. Thank you all for your time and attention. Eight hundred and fourteen in your songbook, please. One of the uh, the men that uh, I baptized recently, that I'd known from my work with the county, had brought another with him, and he is also obeyed the gospel, and then this past Lord's Day brought another with him, and he told me Sunday, he said, I'm planning to fill up this whole pew right here. And I said, I'm sorry you have your sight set so low, but it's a rather long pew, but I have his information here on this card because the Pettingills, once again, have come through, and they have put together his name, address, cards, stamps, other pertinent information we need for those that need encouragement this time, please be sure and pick one of these packets up before you leave tonight. This is our Wednesday packet, and we do this every week if we have to, and this week we certainly would need to do that. If you're ever down and out and you need somebody to pick you up and you're discouraged or depressed, go see Marilyn Lamets. Uh, Lydia was there the other day with her children, and she gave us a card, and I just want to read the card that she wanted read at the church. Uh, she said, thank you for being my church family. I miss everyone so much. Thank you for everything you have done for me and my family. Thank you for the prayers, cards, the food, the visits, and uh, money, and all the kindness shown. And I would like to especially thank the young lady named Sarah that drew me a Christmas tree on my Christmas card. Um, thankful to you. Thank you, rather, and I love you. Uh, you're truly an artist. She's talking about you, Sarah, I think. I pray everyone has a beautiful Christmas and a great New Year. I'm not making this up. If you're depressed, if you feel bad, if you're down and out, go see Marilyn Lummins, and you will feel like you're walking on air. But uh, I wanted to share with you, she asked me to read this card, and so I honor that request. Uh, we want to extend our sympathy tonight to Kathy, uh, who's with us. Um, it's been a rough year for her family. Um, this, I guess it was Sunday, wasn't it? Uh, her, her grandfather actually found her uncle, uh, passed away in their home. And so the funeral will be sometime next week. It's still a little bit up in the air. When we get more settled details, we'll... Is that the one on the last day? Okay. Okay. All right. 
Well, when we find more information, just let us know, and we'll put that in our bulletin. But thank you. Um, don't forget, uh, volunteers are needed. If you can help in prepare communion, preparing or the communion for or baking bread for 2023, please sign the list in the foyer. Uh, in connection with this, Lynn Kilgore is going to be teaching a class on baking communion bread in January. By the way, it is a wonderful communion bread that she makes. It also works for chocolate pie at Christmas, I'm just saying, for the crust, anyway. Please check the sign-up sheet in the foyer for the day that works best for you. Uh, a New Year's Eve brunch will be scheduled not for this Saturday, but Saturday week uh, in the Fellowship Hall uh, at 10 a.m. We will also be having our Sunday for the Savior, actually Sunday Sabbath for the Savior uh, on that Sabbath, um, which will be not this Sabbath, but the next uh, Saturday, that is. So we'll be having that at 10 a.m. on the 31st, so please be sure. And if you have any questions, see Lydia about that. Now, Brian is still, I guess, recovering at home. Acting puny, uh, man, you know. He did have surgery last Wednesday, so we want to remember Brian uh, as he's, and Tammy especially, as she ministers to him. Uh, Mildred Logan is not well. Please remember her uh, as she is uh, struggling day to day. David Bean was carried to the hospital today. Blood pressure has bottomed out. He's hard, having a hard time breathing. They can't get his oxygen level back up. Uh, it's very critical. They're asking, please, that we pray for him. Uh, Jeff Adams' mother had surgery today. Uh, I think she's gone home and is recovering, and we're very thankful to hear that. Uh, anyone else we need to mention on our prayer list? One of the things I was mentioning in our class tonight is the fact that we know there is a God, and we were exploring, questioning, wonder why it is that so many would say there's not a God. And again, I think the answer is simple. People want there not to be a God to answer to. We just want to do what we want to do. But it's like the thing I was saying about reality a moment ago. Reality will catch up to you. You can live in a fantasy all you want. You can deny, bury your head in the sand, however you want to describe it. You can do that indefinitely. And then one day you're going to die. Or the Lord will return. Whether you believe he will or not, he's going to. And the question is, what then? What will I do then? The only hope any human being has is to be found in Christ, in the Son of God. And the only way into Christ is through gospel obedience, believing he is the Son of God, repenting of our sins, confessing faith in him, being immersed in the grave of baptism for the remission of our sin, rising to walk in newness of life. If we can help you in this or any other way, please. Make that need known while together we stand and as we sing.
water spigots on the outside covers them. It's going to get cold this weekend. So please be safe. Everyone be back, Lord willing, coming Sunday. Right. Uh, I got one other. Um, I don't know if anybody knows him from Tallapoosa. Hal Cash, he passed away this morning. So just keep his family in your prayers. Hal Cash, he was a member down there in Tallapoosa. Yeah, so. All right, we'll go ahead and pray now. Our Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for this evening, another time we get to come together. Lord, it's always a blessing to be able to make it here and just hear a portion of your word and study with those that are faithful around us, Lord. Lord, as we hear this word here, let us always remember to rely on your word in the Bible to get us through the day and not let the worldly things we hear and get in our minds and just get our way of thinking distracted or just trashed out where we don't need to be, Lord. Lord, we got so many in this world that are just not in the right state of mind or on the wrong path. Let us always do something to be the light for you through us and our actions and where they can come to the fold and be brought back to you, Lord. As the ones that are sick and uh, may not even have a home, be, uh, be warm, be with them. Let them return to their help. Let the ones who um, are just don't know you, let someone around them be the light that we'll show you to them. How Cash, we ask you to be with him or his family and all of those that are going through this trying times, Lord. Let them always rely on your word and those around them to get through this as it can be troublesome on the heart. Before you leave here, we ask you to be with us, watch over us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.